Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. In the lead-up to the November Turkish elections, violence has resumed between Turkish police forces and Kurdish rebels, a part of the PKK. On Sunday, seven people were killed in a confrontation, and a state of emergency has been declared in more than 100 different Kurdish areas. Also, a widespread media crackdown is taking place across Turkey. And on Monday, three vice journalists were charged with, quote, aiding a terrorist organization for their stories on ISIS, which highlighted their access to the organization. Now joining us to put this all into context is Barish Karaaj. He is a lecturer in international development studies at Trent University in Ontario. Thank you so much for joining us, Barish. Hi, Jessica. Thanks for having me. So, Barish, some are seeing this escalation of violence as being reminiscent of the bloody war in the 90s between the PKK and the Turkish state that claimed the lives of thousands. Can you talk about the escalation of violence in the context, uh, context of this upcoming election? Well, we have not uh, this much violence uh, for a few years, actually. And there has been a, a ceasefire, or there had been a ceasefire, in effect, uh, for, uh, since uh, 2013 until uh, the Turkish state effectively ended it at the end of uh, July. Uh, and uh, since then, uh, we see, again, we see, uh, when, when you watch the news or when you read the newspapers, we, we, we see news about the martyrs. Uh, you know, this is the discourse used by, uh, especially the media, uh, that, that is very close to the AKP and Erdogan. But there's a discourse that is used by both parties, but also by the Kurds. So uh, we, we, we've been hearing and watching the news of many people being killed. And among them are some uh, children, of course. Uh, and as you said, it, it, uh, effectively, there's been a state of urgent, uh, emergency in uh, tens of uh, towns in the uh, predominantly Kurdish uh, uh, populated, populated parts of Turkey. And actually, this is a huge uh, region. And uh, uh, there was so much violence, and we, we actually heard so little about it because uh, the media w was not allowed in those uh, uh, spaces. And even the members of the parliament, the elected members of the parliament, particularly from the uh, HDP, the uh, pro-Kurdish party, were not allowed in their own ridings. The armed forces basically surrounded the towns, and for a couple of days we heard nothing in terms of what was going on in, in, in those uh, uh, places. And of course, this reminds us of uh, the uh, bloody uh, conflict and the war from uh, of the 1990s. And again, uh, for our audience, uh, I need to uh, give you some context. There's been a war going on since uh, 1984, August 1984, between the Turkish state and the PKK, the uh, 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 Workers' Party of uh, Kurdistan. Uh, and this war has claimed the lives of, we don't have exact numbers, but definitely more than uh, 30,000 people from both sides. Uh, some people even put the number at 40,000. And since 2013, when a ceasefire was declared, there was, almost, there was no uh, armed conflict. There were, no one was dying. But again, after the election of uh, June 7th, we see the resumption of this violence, which was initiated, uh, to be clear on this issue, by the Turkish state. And there was retaliation by uh, the Kurdish side, by, by, or, or by the armed wing of the Kurdish movement, the PKK. Okay, and you mentioned the media crackdown. Again, as I said earlier, vice journalists were charged, as well as Turkish media's groups also earlier Tuesday morning. They, they've come after them as well. What are the tactics that the government is using to silence the media, and how are they justifying it? Uh, we see actually an, an escalation of a re, re, uh, 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 repression of the media, particularly since uh, Tayyip Erdogan became president in 2014. Since then, the, uh, the, the Article 299 of the Turkish Penal Code, which is about insulting uh, the president of the uh, Republic of Turkey, has been used uh, numerous times by the lawyers of uh, Tayyip Erdogan, as well as public prosecutors, to repress the media, the critical media. So uh, if you publish uh, anything that is uh, critical of uh, either Tayyip Erdogan, Turkish uh, 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 president, 
or the members of his family who have been uh, you know, involved in uh, corruption, that's what the allegations uh, are, uh, then you become immediately targets. Uh, so uh, early, an interesting thing happens uh, this morning, actually, early this morning, there were police raids on a, a number of media outlets that have been quite critical and that are known to be close to the uh, Fethullah Gulen congregation. Uh, and, and uh, of course, it's a very concerning process. Uh, uh, Turkey ranks 149th on the uh, World Freedom uh, Press Freedom Index out of 180 countries. And Turkey is supposed to be a liberal democracy. But uh, what we've seen, particularly since last year, is quite concerning regarding the freedom of the press in Turkey. And it is only escalating. Uh, when, this is not, of course, restricted to uh, newspapers or TV stations. Uh, this also uh, this can be extended to uh, online uh, outlets. Uh, there has been so, uh, crackdown on uh, the, you know, the use of Twitter and uh, uh, Facebook in Turkey, since particularly uh, uh, Gezi uprisings of, uprising of uh, 2013. Uh, there's also a very interesting phenomenon, and I think uh, our audience might, might be interested in this, uh, and some of this uh, online repression, crackdown, is related to only one individual or one source. We don't know how many people uh, are involved in this. So his name is Fuat Avni, and he's been tweeting uh, online for a, a couple of years now. He, he seems to be part of uh, Erdogan's uh, very, very close uh, circle. And he's been, to, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, Many people argue that he is a member of the Fethullah Gülen congregation. The Fethullah Gülen's people and uh, uh, Erdogan's close circle has been has formed actually a coalition since 2002. But this coalition came to an end in the la in late 2013, and they, since then they've been the biggest enemies. So this guy Fuat Abi has been tweeting regularly regarding what is going on in that close circle and what plans Erdogan uh, is ma making. So a couple of days ago, actually, he tweeted that there would be a huge crackdown on uh, some uh, media institutions. And this morning, this is what we uh, observed. So essentially, Erdogan's administration has a mole in it. That's, that's kind of interesting. I'm trying to get into that space and figuring out why Erdogan would be doing all of this if, if, if not to appeal to his base, or at least, you know, as we mentioned, elections are coming up in November. So this must be strategic electorally. Can you speak to what section of the Turkish populace actually supports policies like these, and why? That's an excellent question. Uh, you know, this whole issue actually is about Erdogan trying to bring a, a, a presidential system to Turkey. So he wants, to con he wants to have more power. He wants to concentrate political power in his own hands. Uh, right now, it is, it is, uh, the uh, you know, president, as a president, he has at least on paper, constitutionally, uh, he has symbolic power. But he wants to turn it into constitutional, real power. So, uh, uh, again, one of the, the deputy uh, prime minister, the, the deputy prime minister, Yasun Akpon, uh, uh, actually about a month ago made it very clear the escalation of violence all this crackdown all this uh, you know in, uh, increase in conflict in turkey is because uh, of the the, the uh, pro kurdish parties and the other democratic forces attempt to not make an erdogan or let him become or bring this presidential system and concentrate even more power in his own hands. So, uh, so what Erdogan and the people close to him, and the AKP government, have been trying to do recently is to disparage the name that the pro-Kurdish party has very carefully produced in the last couple of years. So, but and if possible, maybe, uh, turn uh, the leaders of this party or this movement ineffective. They could be sent to prison. They could, uh, uh, you know, or uh, 
that other measures could be used to uh, render them ineffective. If this full Kurdish party loses the election, which means cannot pass the electoral threshold of, of, of 10 percent, which is actually incredibly high for any democracy, then there's a chance or most likely the AKP will again uh, gain the majority of the, the members of the parliament. Right now, the AKP doesn't have the majority. So this is a, but this is a very, very dangerous gamble, uh, because this, on the one hand, this has escalated violence and conflict that we had not seen since the 1990s. On the other hand, this is eroding the trust that has formed. You know, that's uh, that's been quite uh, shaky actually, but th there has been some trust that started with the so-called peace or solution process between the Turkish state and the Kurdish movement. So this can uh, lead to, I hope this, this will never happen, but this can lead to uh, further escalation and culminate with a civil war. And uh, this can also lead to the division of the country, which, which is something that many, many Turks are concerned about or have been really scared of. Yes, and we're certainly concerned about it, and we're going to keep a close eye on it. Uh, thank you so much, Barish, for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.